Uh, I just want to start off by saying that although my uh, references and examples derive from India, it really is toward maybe uh, looking at the liberal arts in a bigger perspective. And it's not really only specific to India. It's perhaps all nations that have been denying their citizens information or you know, have policies around secrecy. So I want to begin by sort of outlining the fact that there used to be a big dilemma in higher education in India. And this is related to the question of access and that of quality. Uh, something very strange happened in the past few years, and nobody really saw this coming. And now the picture is getting clearer, because uh, when Flame University began, this was about 2007, this picture didn't exist. And as of now, there are liberal arts colleges popping up all around the world. And this is just a snapshot of the kinds of students and uh, the numbers of majors uh, that they're dealing with. And as you can see, there's one in Abu Dhabi, there's one in Singapore, Shanghai, and even England, the British system is reinventing itself. Uh, these countries, like India, have a complicated relationship often to open governance and total transparency. And in many ways, I think we share a lot of the challenges that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the liberal arts in India took a long time to arrive. We inherited a British system of education, and in many ways that emphasized silos. It emphasized super specialization very early. And uh, there's no surprise that we have all these engineers and doctors, because essentially at the age of 17, you had to pick. And you could never go back. You could never retrace your route. So something which was axiomatic and self-evident in the American context, which was choosing between majors, being allowed to sort of major in two things at the same time, was absolutely absent from the Indian landscape, as it also was from the British one, actually, which is why that uh, 2012 college is interesting. But uh, the point is that this new sort of arrival of the liberal arts model uh, around the world has allowed for many things. And of course, they include the smaller sort of faculty student ratio, the ability for research at the undergraduate level, which is very missing from a mass system of education. Uh, and of course, a real time responsiveness, because this is not about you know 400 students in the classroom. This is about maybe a seminar style, 10 students per faculty. So given that this uh, picture is very new to India and to many countries around the world, it's interesting that the liberal arts in the US are themselves facing other challenges and uh, reinventing or molding perhaps you know, some of their older habits. And so it's not surprising to me that in this time we can ask you know, certain questions without sort of any embarrassment. Uh, because there's sort of the change has arrived at our doorstep. And in fact, the changes have happened. So there's a way in which we're just about facing ourselves and you know, kind of responding to what that's meant. One is, of course, has the fundamental arena of knowledge changed? I think the morning's keynote made it very evident that the boundedness of the classroom, uh, the idea of the sage on the stage, right, all of this has really been sort of torn down. And if that has changed, uh, how do we learn differently? So that is to say, academia is no longer what it was. So for us in India, or in Singapore, or in Abu Dhabi, or in Shanghai, what are we inheriting? We're not inheriting, in some sense, um, a given model that we just apply. We have to tweak it, and we have to, of course, adapt it to our needs. So given that, uh, there's a larger mandate that we're also reckoning with, which is the question of access for other people, not just those who get to go to college, which the numbers are actually similar between India and the US. right? Less than 20% of the 18 to 24 age group gets to college. Um, and of course, the quality of that experience varies greatly across different institutions. But the point is really that um, if we used to test people who went to college to see if they mastered the content, we're doing something different now. And I think the idea of the signature project and such reinforces the need to um, assess education differently and to recognize that it's not the same place it used to be. So given that story, it's to me very interesting that around the same time that Arjun Appadavai, he's a cultural anthropologist, and he posed this question and he asked of, uh, especially these mass societies, right, India, China, we've had a very sort of mass approach to education. So it's a lot of people in the system, a lot of people assessed through mass examinations and then pushed out. And now that we're sort of contemplating a different model and we're looking at the liberal arts sort of much more individualized approach, a polarized question about the right to do research, which seems again to be something that any student anywhere in the world should have access to, is a very timely one. And it was all the more timely because it was published in the same, uh, just about after the equivalent of the Freedom of Information Act got passed in India. 
So that is to say, until such time as this happened, we were basically bound by the same rules that you see about efficiency to see in many parts of the world. If you want access to data, you're basically met with the, no, this is official. This is classified. This is not for you. And a lot of the sort of materials were needed for research were couched in that way of secrecy. So when Apadura argues for how is it, how do people who are entering the world of research from outside its Western historical home do so? Right? It's not just about the method, but it's literally about the access to the data. And given that story, uh, it was very interesting that, and this I include the link that you can click on to get government data online, uh, and this happened later, but that this question emerges at the time when that data is finally being liberated. So there is a sort of accountability now that's you know, a mechanism that was not previously possible. I actually had this sort of uh, interesting experience of facing this firsthand because I did my doctoral work on the emergency of 1975 in India, and it was a period of extreme repression. Uh, the, it was 19 months long, and basically the then Prime Minister, Indra Gandhi, suspended the constitution. So there was no rule of law. Preventably, 100,000 people were put into prison, and obviously this met with a lot of opposition. There was voluminous amounts of publication. People were, you know, expressing their dissent. And a lot of this dissent was sort of buried underground, smuggled out of the country and all of that. But the fact is there was definitely, it didn't go unnoticed or, you know, met with silence. Now, many years after the fact, when I'm looking for information on the emergency in India, I find nothing. So one of the sort of very interesting inquiry, uh, inquiry commissions that took place after the emergency was called the Shah Commission. And the Shah Commission basically inquired into the excesses of the emergency. Now you might think that, you know, this is just a simple story about, um, you know, people unlawfully being treated badly. But there was a horrendous stuff that happened during this time, uh, including mass forced sterilization. Right? Men were forcibly sterilized and uh, this was to control the population problem. Uh, people were, in terms of urban areas, evicted because it was ugly that there were slums in that area, so they were moved physically out of the main part of the city. And all of this is very critical to the way in which we sort of think of ourselves as a democracy or not, right, after the fact. So when I'm in India, I'm looking at one of the premier archival collections, which is known as the Nehru Memorial Archives. There's not a smith, there's no trace of the emergency. It's as if it never happened. And the Shah Commission report, which is a government uh, official document, which is cataloging through witnesses and other testimonies, the excesses of the emergency is destroyed all around the world, save for five copies. And literally, this is some sort of PR exercise where you just expunge the record and hope that nobody will ever find it. So I got lucky because the University of Chicago Library has a fabulous collection of South Asian uh, resources. And I found a copy of the Shah Commission report in the University of Chicago Library and felt it my moral duty to scan it and upload it. And this is a project that a bunch of us, uh, you know, have been talking about and finally it took off. It was called the Archives and Access Project. And what we started doing is a lot of us who were PhD scholars in different parts of the world who had, in a sense, assembled our own mini archives of things, basically said, let's put this back out there in the open commons and see what other people do with it. So in that spirit, uh, the emergency papers, which were mine, uh, sort of accessed from the Chicago libraries, sort of uh, went on the side. And in many ways, inaugurated that spirit of what sorry, Apadana, I was talking about, which was the right to research. Right? So I need to want to know this as a citizen. How do I get my hands on this? And the answer is other citizens help you out. Right? They also sort of scan and upload and this is what you get. So uh, given that story, uh, soon after, we saw fairly sort of, uh, at least seemingly efforts made by the state to also upload and make available their own data. And these are some examples. So for instance, um, the films, di films division was the propaganda wing of the government, but it also had a whole lot of other documentation. And so now on their website, like YouTube, you can download videos from the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, so there's sort of interesting stuff for students to deal with and do things with. Uh, the other one is the open government in their data. A uh, lot of my sort of colleagues in GIS and things also use this for demographic and other data. And uh, interestingly, in addition to the, op the state archives, we have the crowdsourced popular ones. So two of them, one is the People's Archive of Rural India, seeks to, again for crowdsourcing, uh, allow for or invite collaboration where people who um, are located in different parts of the country are literally archiving the last extent, you know, practice in farming or some other sort of thing. So it's been a recent initiative, but very timely and necessary. 
And the Indian Memory Project also has been one where people have uh, been asked to uh, uh, how do you say, submit their photographs, family photographs. And often at certain times or certain events, you know, these things are not very official, but there's a real curiosity to how that looks. So given that story, um, as I said, the archival record has been lacking, but there's an attempt to supplement it and to sort of fill in the blanks. So one of the first things we did in our Gulfian Studies major was that we started assembling the official archival links, just to sort of test out what do they have, what is missing, and all of that. So on this site called South Asian Culture of WordPress, we put up of different countries, Nepal, Afghanistan, Qatar, uh, India, Maldives, uh, the government archives, and then some subset ones. So they would be language specific ones. Uh, so, for instance, in Germany, there's a fabulous archive of Nepali sources, including films, ethnographic films, and all of that. So, it's just for anyone who's interested in an area, where do you begin, right? Often you begin with the official record, and this was how we began sort of compiling the archival stuff. And then we started looking at the unofficial stuff. So, of course, a lot of it is uh, biased. And yet, uh, things like the Rare Book Society of India has, you know, digitized copies of things that people may not have normally gotten access to. For most people in the U.S. and otherwise, I think, you know, you're so used to having a robust museum sort of culture that the recognition that other countries don't have it comes a little late. And I think, uh, even for us, when I was a doctoral student here, for me to realize that the Ushakabu Library is far more robust than any library I'll ever go to in India is tragic, but it's also sort of uh, you know a need of amendment. And that maybe spurs in some ways the need to catalog and list all of this. So given that, we began by sort of looking at archives, official and unofficial, and students started working and playing with this stuff. So for instance, we began, one student started a blog called Food Studies in South Asia, where she looked at these other archival repositories to cull from a specific information linked to food studies. And another then built on what she was doing, uh, so this is a group of actually three students. This was an introduction to cultural studies course. And these students uh, are negotiating the question of regional identity through food. So they were also, you know, Indian food is never Indian food. It's Kashmiri and it's Rajasthani and it's all of that. And so they sort of split up, not often for the region they belong to, but to sort of, you know, really nuance in some ways what is the understanding of that identity. And you had these various states. So this is just one of them, which was the Amra food project. Um, another sort of uh, interesting thing that a lot of students did was aggregate data from different sources. So let's say there are film posters in different cinemas, uh, which exist in different digital archives or offline ar you know, archives. And so this student was trying to look at you know, the styling of these images, so from earlier sort of film history moments to later, in a project which was an aggregated essentially project, the film poster archive. This is another recent one, which um, I wish I pulled it up. But anyway, you can feel free to look at it later. Uh, children's literature. When I grew up, and I think this is true of most people who've had the British Empire sort of uh, look around their corners, all the sort of children's literature was British. Like you read *The you Blyton know, and The Famous Five, and this was sort of what everyone grew up on. And alongside that, you just about had the epics. So you had the Ramayana, the Mahabharat, you know, those stories. And now there's been this sort of new recognition of the fact that there's all these different forms of storytelling, visual as well as narrative, in so many different ways. And a lot of independent publishers have been coming out with this stuff. But because it's such a tiny effort compared to like the big penguin and Harvey Collins, uh, the industry is definitely very scattered. So these students literally comb through 96 different publisher catalogs to extract from you know them uh, different categories. So they had like adaptation, mythological, um, there was the visual styles of folk styles that we used to animate these stories. So there was this sort of not just aggregative process, but also analytical attempt at, you know, sort of uh, uh, making some meaning of all these new uh, initiatives. And uh, I think that, yeah, this has sort of been, a, you know, great sort of variety in terms of what different sort of efforts have looked like. I'm just showing you a few of them. Another sort of colleague of mine does mapping spatial analysis stuff where I am, and one of the things they've been doing is scanning antique maps as the template on which to then uh, superimpose more contemporary images of the city, and then in a sort of time lapse where it's about you know environmental change and all of that. So they're essentially creating atlases, right, through the scanning of these maps uh, juxtaposed alongside more recent iterations, 
And the fact is, you can't do, you can't map the change unless you have some idea of where it begins. So in that sense, the sort of the initial legwork of just trying to produce, uh, you know, things which are in the open, I would hope to mean that they're not really copyrighted, you know, in that sense, uh, is at least our first step in attempting to make some sense of all of this. So the, another uh, benefit for a, of a range of content is that you can finally sort of address contemporary issues because you have a historical perspective. So one of the sort of problems with India, especially even being there or studying it, is that there is this inability to sort of, how do you say this, um, culturally comment or critique or all of that on contemporary issues because everything becomes a historical argument. And history is a you know dodgy business uh, at best, but the sort of uh, effort of trying to sort of contextualize the contemporary debates through longer, longer, longer views is a function of students engaging with primary source materials. And so a lot of our digital humanities or spatial sort of projects are about students, I think, making their own evaluations and assessing the material on their own. And uh, one of the things that has been really sort of significant over the past year have been these student protests that have just taken over the nation. Um, there are four campuses that this project actually uh, talks about, where a student, let's say, who protested something was arrested for sedition, right, put in the prison, stuff like that. This is very sort of reminiscent of the emergency, and there's this kind of discomfort people have with how is this even possible. And the new sort of neoliberal conversation says, well, your education is subsidized, so you don't have the right to dissent. You know, so there's sort of these other debates that are going on, and it's all happening in real time. And I think uh, students are engaging with this question of what does this mean. So even in terms of cataloging the social media stuff, right? About uh, and these are also as you can see this that hashtag. Oh, this was in Bengal, West Bengal, that one, uh, where whether it's Facebook or other tweets or whatever, people have these you know responses to all of these events. So kind of putting all of that in one place. This one does it through the use of Omega. And uh, it's the creation of not an archive of old stuff, but real time unfolding. But all in all, uh, the fact is that we need more engagement. And this hopefully enables it uh, even further. And in many ways, uh, hopefully, there will be a lot more of this you know, to sort of look forward to in the future. But we do need to sort of encourage them to learn the tools and to sort of give them that pedagogical space to perhaps produce this work. Thank you.